All right, good to see all of you in chat. I definitely encourage you uh, telling me about what you've got going on, where you're, where you're at, what you're doing in chat. I don't mind side conversations. Keep it clean. We are a family show, as you can tell by the horrible dad jokes. <laughs> try to keep it, uh, try to keep it family friendly for those of you who uh, are weird enough to want to stream this stuff with your kids around. You got to be careful if you do that because you may turn them into as big of uh, AC nerds as I am. So you might want to stay away from that for for good reason. Ken's here. Thanks for joining us, Ken. Steve, my good buddy Steve is here. Thanks for all the support, Steve. I always appreciate you. Adam, John, David, Mac, Muhammad, all kinds of folks. Good to see you all. All the way from Brunei. That's really cool. Thanks for joining us. Man, already 130 of you here, even before we get started. All right, so let's get started with this thing. Um, just a quick intro into what we're going to be talking about today. Recovering best practices, but we are going to have a giveaway at the end, and I bet you can't guess what we're going to give away. It's one of the things <laughs> shown on the screen right now. You guessed it. We're giving away a full tank of contaminated refrigerant. <laughs> giving it away to the highest bidder. So uh, anybody who wants some uh, R134A mixed with propane... You're going to be the lucky winner at the end. <laughs> yes, I am ridiculous. That, that, is, that is true. That is true. I mean, at least I, I think you're saying that I'm ridiculous. I'm, I'm not sure. You may be talking to somebody else, but it is true that I am ridiculous. So, uh, all right, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Let's go ahead and bring the camera on. Um, first thing you'll notice is I'm wearing my dad to the power of 10 t-shirt, um, and that means that I have 10 dad powers. Uh, one of them is dad jokes, which you all get to benefit from. The other is dad bod, um, which nobody but my wife gets to benefit from. And then the other eight, um, I haven't written out yet. But, you know, they're all important, critical dad powers. So, uh, yeah, thanks for joining us. Today we're going to be talking about recovery best practices. We're going to be doing a really great giveaway at the end of an MR45. Um, this is going to be a call-in show. This is going to be a call-in show. So I don't want you to call in until I tell you to call in because that won't work. That's one thing about this is that if people start calling in the call-in number at the wrong time, it will interrupt the show, so don't do that. Um, but when the time comes, this is going to be the call-in number. So if you want to write that down, that's going to be the call-in number. If you want to advantage uh, for the, for the uh, giveaway, and then also if you have anything you wanted to talk to me about, that's going to be the call-in number. Don't call now, though. Don't call in the middle of, of, uh, of nowhere. Just wait until we're ready for that. Um, today we're going to have uh, Jason Objut's going to be calling in and talking about some of the the changing landscape in the EPA side of things. There's a lot changing on uh, leak, you know, leak repair, leak detection, uh, leak rates, recovery, all that on the EPA side of things. So there's going to be that, uh, but mostly we're just going to be talking through some best practices, some some stuff that we've all talked about, uh, learned throughout the years. This isn't obviously just me. This comes from a lot of really smart people who do this every day. That's the thing about HVAC schools is we curate some of the uh, some of the smartest folk out there in the industry. I'm going to go ahead and turn my volume up a little bit because it looks like I am just a touch quiet. So hopefully you can all hear me. Um, all right, so let's get started. Recovery best practices and giveaway. All right, so let's let's start with some EPA basics. And Jason's going to call in at. Uh, 10 minutes after 8, and uh, talk a little bit more about this. But the basics uh, from the EPA standpoint, and really in, in talking with the EPA, if you haven't heard the podcast that I did with the EPA, uh, I think it was a good podcast. And, uh, you know, their interest is in just making sure that you're not venting, you know, and enforcing the, enforcing the rules. Um, there's a lot of talk out there about the, you know, the EPA man going to get you and all that stuff, and that really isn't uh, realistic. That's not... That doesn't happen um, in regular in real life. Uh, in real life, the EPA is not out there uh, punishing regular technicians for doing their jobs. Um, they're out there 
looking for people who are intentionally venting. And so EPA basics, number one, don't vent refrigerants. Uh, there are some exceptions to that, refrigerants that can be vented, uh, but most of us don't work with those refrigerants. So things like uh, propane, isobutane, um, ammonia, and CO2 can be vented, but most of the refrigerants we work with, whether it's HFCs, uh, HCFCs, CFCs, uh, HFOs, none of them can be legally vented. So uh, don't mix refrigerants. So when people talk about a refrigerant being a drop-in refrigerant, uh, that doesn't mean you can top off. That means that uh, there is minimal changes that have to be made to the system to pull out one refrigerant and put in another. Um, again, this all relates to recovery because you know recovery is a big moment when a lot of this stuff happens. And even mixing refrigerants in the recovery environment, we all know it has to happen sometimes. If you're out on a job and you fill up one tank and all you have is another tank and it's got a little bit of something else in it, what are you going to do, right? I mean, you, you find yourself in those positions. But as much as it depends on us, we don't want to mix. Now, if you have a choice between mixing or venting, uh, I'm talking about in terms of a tank, then mix, obviously. But we don't really want to mix refrigerants. We certainly don't want to mix them in the system. But even in a recovery tank, we want to stay away from mixing, not just because of uh, you know the, the environmental factors, but because of the economic factors. So if you mix refrigerant, uh, especially on top of something that's valuable like R22, you take something that you could actually be getting money back for, and now you're going to be charged to dispose of that refrigerant. So those are some things to think about. Um, another thing is uh, recharging is generally okay. So on the good news side, there's a lot of companies out there who are saying, oh, it's illegal to recharge. Are, there are some circumstances where it is uh against statute to recharge, but those are usually going to be on larger pieces of equipment. And we're going to talk about that equipment under 50 pounds that contains under 50 pounds. There is no recharge limitation uh, as it relates to uh, the United States. And if you get in other countries, obviously they have different rules, but in the United States, you can recharge equipment as long as you want. It, it could have a, it could have a leak as big as your pinky. Um, and legally speaking, you would be okay to recharge. And some people will say, well, that's venting. Again, based on the EPA's ruling uh, on this and the conversation that I had with Jeremy Arling from the EPA on the podcast, uh, if you're recharging for the purpose of getting the equipment operational, not, you know, not pulling traders and that sort of thing, you know, kind of gaming the system, you can't put nitrogen on top of an existing charge and use that as an excuse to vent. That's not allowable. Um, there are a lot of kind of tricks that people think they're they're you know, tricking the system, but you're, you're, it comes down to you're just not allowed to vent. Um, de minimis is fine. Hooking hoses on and off, all that stuff is all fine. All of that just regular process of servicing the equipment is fine. Strader gets stuck and it blows the charge. That's fine. It wasn't intentional venting. Now, when you do the whole oops, you know, now that is intentional venting and that's not allowed. I mean, let's be practical about this. So another one that's a common misconception is that a lot of people believe that you have to recover all equipment into a vacuum. For most of what we work on in uh, comfort air conditioning, uh, especially residential, recovery to zero is most commonly all you have to do. That means just recovery to atmospheric. And the, another exception to that in the EPA, and we're going to show this slide here shortly, is that if a system is known to be leaking, it doesn't matter its size. You don't have to pull it below atmosphere because that would be, um, that would be silly. If you, something's leaking, you pull it below, pull the pressure below atmospheric pressure, you're going to pull air and moisture into the system, and that would be a bad thing. So there's some misconceptions that are commonly um, put out there by contractors who took the EPA exam and maybe got some things confused. But the good news is for most of us who do residential, like commercial, um, you're not working on really big stuff, then re recharging is generally fine, and recovery to zero is generally going to be what's acceptable. I'll show you the charts here in a second. And then also, uh, just as best practice, this you know the codes vary or the regulations vary, but just keep records of charging and recovery, especially when you're taking a piece of equipment out of service. So if you're taking a piece of equipment and you're going to be disposing of it, keep records of the refrigerant that you removed from that equipment, the data on the equipment, what it was, and keep that somewhere that you can recall it later if the EPA ever asks. And so this comes up a lot because people will say, well, hey, the EPA is not enforcing this. You know, there's a very... Uh, a conservative uh, administration in place right now, so the EPA isn't doing a lot of these sorts of actions. But just keep in mind that that can all change. So in the future, we could have a different administration and a different mindset, and they could come knocking on the door and say, hey, show me from four years back your records of systems that you decommissioned, and you want to have that data. 
because again, you don't know how things are going to change, and keeping good records are what are going to is what is going to protect you. Now, again, it's very unlikely that they're going to come after really small contractors, but the larger you get, the more you have these risks. So, what I always tell people is, if you're not doing it all the right way today, don't get worked up about it. Just start taking steps in the right direction. That's what everybody wants you to do. And again, even if so, even if you're one of these people who's like, hey, this is all, this is all hooey. Um, you know, I, I don't believe in any of this. Well, it doesn't really matter because ultimately, um, if you are, uh, if you have the potential of getting in trouble someday, uh, you need to abide by these things so that way you can cover your bases uh, and make sure that you're not gonna, you're not gonna get in trouble. It's not gonna hurt you financially because most most likely what would happen is uh, you would get a big fine, and that's something that we don't want. Uh, if the time were to come where the winds where the winds would change. And so that's where you want to be careful. Just keep keep good records um, and just keep good records of charging and recovery in general. It's a really good idea to keep those good records, not just because of the EPA, but also because it helps you have good records of what went on with, with the equipment so that you can know what's been happening. Because one of the biggest areas that's, that service businesses lose money is by adding refrigerant that they don't charge for or recovering refrigerant or making alterations in the system that aren't needed and if those aren't represented in records, and we know this happens all the time, texts go out, they make a small change, oh, I'll just add half a pound, oh, I'll just take out a couple pounds, and it's not properly tracked, well, then you're going to lose control over what's going on in the field. You're not billing for the things you're doing, and it is a big loser monetarily. And I know firsthand because we uh, had, some, had some challenges with our own um, – with our own company with that at times where technicians were just, oh, I'll give them a pound, I'll give them half a pound, whatever, and they weren't writing it down, that leads to that leads to profitability issues. So those are some things to definitely look for from the EPA standpoint. Now let's look at this chart because this is one of the ones that is most often um, confused, and I'm going to go ahead and hide my face so that way you can see the whole screen. So on very high-pressure and high-pressure appliances that contain less than 200 pounds of refrigerant, which is that's going to be most of the comfort air conditioning that we work in, right? It's going to be rare that you're going to have systems in comfort air conditioning that are going to have more than 200 pounds of refrigerant. Um, you can see that in all of these cases, you pull to zero, and that's just atmospheric. So that's all you're going to do. When you get into 200 pounds or more refrigerant, uh, medium pressure appliances, uh, and low pressure appliances, that's where you do need to pull a recovery into a vacuum. And again, it's confusing in the EPA, some of the EPA guidelines, because they'll say things like, um, th they'll call recovery evacuating refrigerant. So they'll say you have to evacuate refrigerant down to a certain level. Well, th they're talking about recovery. When we say evacuation, we mean vacuum, uh, mostly. And this is also a regional thing. I've heard different people in different uh, areas call it different things. But generally speaking, when we're talking about pulling a vacuum, we call that evacuation. And we call recovery the removal of refrigerant from the system. And most of what we're working on is going to be just pulling to atmospheric. And again, any of these, if they're known to have a leak, you don't need to pull them below because what's the point at that point, right? You're just going to be pulling air into the system. So it's not valuable to do that. All right. just want to make sure that Jason's not calling in. Jason, if you're listening, you can call in whenever you're ready. Also... Um, uh, leak repair regulations. This is another one that comes up a lot, and this is the note that people get confused because it says here, the leak repair regulations apply to industrial process refrigeration, commercial refrigeration, and comfort cooling appliances containing 50 pounds or more. And that rule remains in place. Oh, here we go. We got Jason calling in. Let's see if this works. Hey, Jason. Hey, how we doing? Good, good. It's good to, good to hear from you. It sounds like this is actually working. I'm excited. <laughs> Am I the, the the test run? Uh, yeah, you actually are. So that's I mean, is that does that show my respect for you, or is that a bad thing? I'm trying to think how this. No, it's it's total respect. Is it okay? Good, good, because that's what I was intending it to be. So uh, yeah, thanks for joining us. I was actually just getting into uh, the common misconception about leak repair, and uh, you know, people saying that you can't recharge typical commercial uh like commercial and residential equipment even if it's less than 50 pounds so i was i was covering that um but the reason why i wanted to have you on today was you've you're one of these guys who knows everything or seems to always be in the know about all these changes that we've got going on in the epa and so rather than asking you a leading question um what, what's going on right now like where are we at right now with <laughs> with the epa 
there's been quite a few things actually that are going on. <clears throat> this the the most recent. Uh, well, the the final rule. I'll start with this. The final rule from uh, 2018, where they rescinded the leak repair and uh, <clears throat> testing requirements from HFC. So, the leak testing, record keeping, those sorts of things that we just learned from the 2016 rule have been rescinded from HFCs. However, they still apply to the anything ozone depleting. Right. So, our 22 systems and the like still have to abide by these leak rates and testing and record keeping. Right. The, 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 the biggest thing that just happened was uh, a court ruling based on SNAP 20 and 21. I don't know if you remember, but uh, the Mexichem and Arkema versus the, the EPA lawsuit that happened uh, in 2017, which overturned uh, SNAP 20. And basically what that was is they were phasing out HFCs. They were delisting. I shouldn't use the word phase out. Delisting HFCs. And these companies sued and got it overturned. So the EPA issued a new ruling saying, listen, we're not going to delist these HFCs anymore. Well, about a month ago, the court ruled said, listen, we didn't overturn the whole thing. We just overturned half of it. You banned the whole thing, which was an illegal procedure. You were only supposed to ban half of it. So now we're in limbo again. <clears throat> so technically what this means is, if you have a system that works with an ozone depleting refrigerant and you want to replace it with an HFC, uh, you are allowed to. Now it's going to be up in the air. Uh, any of these uh, alternative refrigerants that we use in systems to replace our 22, the, the 22 or 27 different replacement refrigerants that have been uh, marketed as a replacement for R22 in residential or in uh, refrigeration, uh, you're, if they're HFCs, you know, you're fine, but this ruling throws that uh, into debate. The EPA hasn't addressed this yet. Okay. The reason it got overturned was because part of that rule says <clears throat> even the people that already switched, they're going to have to stop using them. They said, well, listen, that's illegal. If they already switched from ozone depleting to HFCs, you can't make them switch again. They've already switched. So that's why they lost in court. But the rule did state that, listen, if you want to go from R22 to, say, a 407C, now you're no longer going to be able to do that. Got it. Yeah. So, so the EPA hasn't responded yet. Okay. And do you have this any just sense, happened about a month ago. Do you have any sense on what you know? Maybe through the grapevine, um, what what they might decide or what those ramifications might be for contractors in the field. I think this is going to uh, become uh, a moot point, if you will, to to coin the term. There is something called the AIM Act. It's the American Industrial and Manufacturing Act. It's in the, the Senate right now. It, it passed through the House. It's in the Senate. And what it does is phase down HFCs like the Kigali Amendment. So if that were to pass, and it's, it's teetering on the edge of passing very soon, uh, we would have to start phasing down HFCs like the rest of the world. We would be on par with what everybody else is doing. And that would make all of these rules and rulings and everything null and void. It would just be, here's the new policy, enforce it. Right, right. So for right now, I guess um, the, the biggest ramification is is that, yes, when we're talking about R22, I mean, because that's a big one. When we're talking about R22, the new rules relating to things like record keeping and leak rates and all that, those still apply because R22 is still ozone depleting. But the new stuff no longer applies to refrigerants like R410A that are non-ozone depleting. Um, correct? That is Am I correct. hearing that correct? Okay, okay. But that doesn't mean, because I think what some people have heard or gotten a sense is that, well, now it's you can vent uh, HFCs. You know, like now, <laughs> now the rules are off as far as HFCs, and that's not true. No, that is not the case at all. Right. Yeah, no, I've heard it, though. I, mean, uh, I don't know if you've heard it, but I've definitely heard it. Oh, I've heard, heard it. it, too. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, – this this other ruling, what it's really going to affect is these alter the market for alternative refrigerants for R22 in you know keeping the system operating longer by instead of putting 22 back there, putting an alternative refrigerant that is non ozone depleting. But if it's classified as an HFC, uh, if this rule is allowed to stand, uh, that's going to make that market go away. Yeah. And that's and the refrigerants market right now is in so much flux right now. What impact? What impact do you think that's having to the industry? Um, what's your perspective on that? To be honest, we're one of the only countries still using uh, HFCs, so our manufacturers here can't export anything overseas anywhere. 
uh, because they're not using those types of refrigerants. They're on HFOs or HFC, HFO blends, or even natural refrigerants, uh, hydrocarbons. And other countries are dumping all of their HFC equipment and refrigerant into the U.S. market relatively cheap. So it puts, you know, American manufacturers at a disadvantage. <laughs> Again, this is, these are based on marketing reports and things like that. So it's not something I'm just, you know, pulling out of my backside here. Yeah. I mean, you've been known to do that. That's that's your reputation. <laughs> <laughs> At times, yes. But the much the uh, opposite, much the opposite. <clears throat> the the thing to take away from that is that eventually we're going to have to catch up with what the rest of the world is doing. Yeah, and and that's why I am. Even though you know I loved R twenty two and uh, all that, I'm actually a pretty big advocate of figuring out ways of, for making uh, naturals work, um, refrigerants that we're just not going to have to worry about this moving forward. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a hard conversation, but I think it's a d the direction that I want us to to start going. But again, you know, I'm just one person, and we all have to uh, just abide by and roll with the rules as they are currently. So, what is this doing? Because obviously, you're involved a lot with obviously ESCO and the RAC manual, and a lot of that has to do with preparation for the EPA exam. So, what is that doing to you from that standpoint? Well, as of right now, nothing has changed on the exam except for the leak rate. Um, They've rephrased, we've had to rephrase the questions that deal with leak rates. But it, it used to say any regulated refrigerant. Now it states ozone depleting refrigerant. So from that standpoint, we're good. Right. However, if and when the AIM pass, uh, the AMAC passes, now that's going to change some things up. That We're going to have to rework this exam. The good thing is we can throw out all these other uh, <clears throat> rulings and overturned rulings and then third and fourth and fifth rulings and addendums, all of that goes away and it's just one clear cut law that you got to learn. And that, that makes it so much easier. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Well, great. Um, anything else you have going on right now that you want to share with the, with the group? I'm working with uh, AHRI and I'm part of the uh, AHRI safe refrigerant uh, transition task force. And <clears throat> what we're doing is trying to establish again, uh, nationwide, instead of the individual states all having different refrigerant regulations in their building codes and uh, in the uh, code manuals, we're trying to get everyone to get on the same boat. You know, uh, this is what we want. This is kind of how we want the transition. So if you're a technician in Texas, you're doing the same things and, and uh, using the same units as the people in Florida or the people in California. Right now, California has some of the most strict uh, EPA regulation or uh, refrigerant regulations compared to other states. So all of these rulings don't affect them because they're already five and six steps ahead of everybody else. <clears throat> so what the transition task force is trying to do is get everybody on the same page yeah. so that manufacturers can make one unit that they can sell anywhere. Right now they're making a California unit and a Chicago unit and a Texas unit. And it's really kind of making it tough. <laughs> Some manufacturers said, listen, I'm not going to sell units in California or I'm not going to sell units in Chicago because I'm not going to have six different models coming off the line with different refrigerants and different requirements. It's making it really tough. So what the transition task force is trying to do is have one level playing field for manufacturers and technicians across the country. So everything's kind of like the electric code has, you know, the electricians have their, their national code and everybody does, you know, does the same thing. We, we, they're trying to do the same thing with the, uh, the refrigerant uh, industry. Yeah, it's super important. I mean, let alone manufacturing is one side of it, but from the technician standpoint, you know, having so many different refrigerants and then you have to have multiple recovery tanks. And then, you know, if, you ha if you're dealing with some refrigerants being flammable and there's, you know, may maybe have a higher flammability, maybe they're an A2L and, you know, okay, does your recovery machine handle it? And it's just all these things that become really challenging for us if we don't have a lot of clarity on what the the refrigerants are going to be um or at least you know maybe there's not one but at least it's got to be a small handful um it's been so tough right. as you know in the refrigeration industry and if we if we do that nationally it's there's so much Im so much impact to that and what the task force is doing is making information available you know if there's something that uh they feel the technicians should know or code officials should know or you know first responders fire chiefs those they have a website, it's on AHRI site, and there's a little tab that say, uh, says safe refrigerant task. If you go there, all the, I mean, there's a couple of hundred people on the people from the UL, all the different manufacturers from the, the labor unions, instructors, chemists. I mean, everybody is on this committee and we're all divided in this. And every, every little bit of information we develop, 
It's put on the website for everybody to use. It's not being sold. It's not being hidden. It's on the website. So if you want to know something about an A2L refrigerant, there's PowerPoint presentations up there. There's white papers up there for everybody to go and read. Yeah, and that, it's free. That's great. Yeah, that's exactly what we need for these sorts of things, for sure. You don't want to have that sort of information behind a paywall. So that's awesome. Great. And well, you don't need to log in or nothing like that either. You don't need to be a member. You don't have to put your email in. It's a free site for everybody to use. And on the is, HRI site. The, on the AHRI site. Okay, great. Um, final thing I want to mention um, before I move on and let you go is uh, the ninth edition of Refrigeration and Air Conditioning Technology is out. Are you, are you working on the 10th already? I mean, your ninth is, ninth yes, is the latest, we are. right? All right, all right. Uh, but Jason is uh, one of the authors and one of the, one of the guys who's really working hard to continue to improve that. Um, if you don't have Refrigeration and Air Conditioning Technology, uh, on your shelf, I'm looking at mine right over here right now. Um, it's a great book, and it's constantly being improved. It's a curriculum. It is the curriculum for our industry, honestly. So uh, great work on it, as always, and thank you so much for everything that you do for our industry. I will uh, real quick tell you that uh, ESCO is working on an e-learning site. We've been building it for about the last six months, and it's really been pushed to the forefront with everyone having to be uh, at home and the schooling having to happen at home. So it's being brought on in little bits, but if you go to the ESCO site, there's a lot of stuff that's free uh, for anyone to watch, contractors, technicians. There's some, you know, Eugene, who is one of the authors on the rack manual, has done a lot of stuff. I've done a lot of stuff. Uh, <clears throat> some of the stuff is obviously paid, you know, for subscription style, but there's a lot of it, a ton of it. Bill's phone's been on, um, Dr. Chuck, from Camores has been on tons of people, but I mean, all that stuff is really free. Great, yeah, that's and, and ESCO is a great organization. Um, I was really bummed that the uh, that the conference was canceled this year because I was excited to go and, and uh, interact and do all the things we do. So, so yeah, uh, go check out the ESCO site. Um, Jason's book on uh, gas furnaces is excellent as well. So go check that out. Um, a lot of good stuff. Thanks for the plug. Yeah, yeah, no, it's a good. It's I'm looking at it over here on my on my shelf as well. <laughs> um, you've got to invest in in good training in your organizations. I mean, I, I know so few of us have time to do a lot of reading, but uh, but you got to have those resources that you go to when the time is right and when you get the time. So thank you for being such a such a good force in the industry, and I mean it. I mean, you, you know how much I appreciate everything you do. I I appreciate everything you do, Brian. All right. Thanks, Jason. I appreciate you, buddy. You got it. I'll talk to you later. See ya. All right. So, yeah, big thanks to Jason. He's a really great guy, and I wanted to have him on to talk about those uh, those updates, which is a little bit of a segue from what we were talking about. But it struck me that some of these standards uh, now currently don't really apply, at least in the same way, to HFCs like 410A, one of the best examples. Uh, and now, currently, that's been rescinded, and so that you still can't vent but some of these new things, like the record-keeping standard, don't apply to 410A, but they still apply to R22. They still apply to ozone-depleting refrigerants. So, yeah, big thanks to Jason. Always always uh, am excited for what he's doing. Uh, so another thing is uh, when we talk about recovery, one of the first things about recovery is how many tanks do you keep? So you've got multiple tanks on the truck, and this is a question. So put it in the chat. How many tanks, how many recovery tanks do you have on the truck? Because if you're working with four refrigerants, as we often have, you have R22, I mean, not four refrigerants, four tanks. You've got R22 and 410A. But if you don't have a backup tank, then what do you do once that tank is nearly full? You know, you don't have anywhere to go. And so ideally, we would have four tanks in the truck. But realistically, honestly, we're lucky if people have two. Um, and so making good use of, ooh, hold on a second, my, my mic's doing something. Test one, two. Test one, two. That was weird. Sorry. Um, so making the best use of uh, the tanks that you have means that you have to be really diligent about what is in your tank. And one of the best ways to do that is to always use a scale, which, I mean, we should be doing that anyway, but then also have a regular cycle uh, where you're turning them in at your shop or at the supply house, whatever you use, and so that you're always keeping a tank that's you know, if not empty, doesn't have a lot of refrigerant in it, which is tricky because some supply houses don't want to take tanks that aren't completely full, and so it's this challenge. Um, but again, it, it's, it's, it's a tricky business, and this is where people who are technicians and they understand the trade know that there's a perfect world of what we would love to have, which is at least four tanks, but then there's the reality of the space in our vehicles, and 
you know, so not everybody can fit that. And again, if you got a full size van, you can probably fit four and you really should have four, but you also need to make sure that all four are properly mounted. And, you know, you can't just throw them in the back of the truck like some people do, i.e. Bert. Uh, he's, he's gotten a lot better. His truck is much better than it used to be. So I'm going to stop ragging on him, but that's a big question. And I don't really have an answer to it. It really just means that you got to set up and you got to have a good process for it. All right. So let's talk about the question of when you recover, because this is a, a broad question. Do you add the refrigerant back into the system that you pulled out? Because that's one of the reasons why we recover, right? Is that we don't have to charge the customer for their refrigerant. Say you're doing something like, uh, I don't know, changing a compressor. That'd be a common one, a reversing valve, something that's inside of, on a split system, inside the condensing unit. Now, obviously, if you have the ability to pump down, then you can pump down some of that refrigerant. But now with a lot of scrolls not allowing for pump down and with a lot of um, the microchannel condenser coils not allowing for pump down, now there's going to be more recovery than there ever was. Same thing is true of ductless systems, right? Working on a ductless system and you think the charge is wrong, then your best bet is to pull the refrigerant charge out. Well, now, so that we'll use that as an example. So you pull that refrigerant charge out of the ductless unit. You weigh it out. Now, are you going to put that same charge back in the system? And that's a question. But here's the things to think about. If, if it's a burnout, so if you have a compressor that's failed due to grounding um, or you've had any sort of, you know, tripping break or arcing type of situation, then I never want you putting that refrigerant back in that same system. I'm just going to go ahead and suggest not doing that. Or if you have any reason to believe that there are some sort of contaminants or non-condensable gases in the system. Now, with non-condensable gases, you can transfer it to a tank, let it sit, and then charge it as liquid, and you're not going to put the non-condensables back in. And that's something you can do, given if you have enough time or what the circumstance is. But that's one factor. Another is, is that, if is it possibly mixed? And we run into this more and more because there are more and more people who are putting uh, alternative refrigerants in on top of things like R22, or somebody who goes up and hooks up to a system and thinks it's 410A when it's 22, and they start putting 410A, and then they say, oops, right? And so sometimes we run into these cases where things just aren't matching the pressure-temperature relationship the way it's supposed to. And in those circumstances, what are you left doing, right? I mean, your only option is to, you can pull it out, put it, put it in a tank, or let the system equalize, and look at it on a PT chart, but what if it doesn't really perfectly match with anything? Well, now you're stuck with pulling it out and starting with a virgin charge. And so these are all cases where, do you have a burnout? Go to virgin charge. Is it possibly mixed? Go to virgin charge. Is your tank contaminated? Now, this is a really tough one. I had a really heart-to-heart, uh, -heart, a real heart-to-heart -heart conversation with a reclaimer, recycler, a company that brings back refrigerant and then pays you for it, basically. A really good guy. Um, and I asked him, I said, you know, are these tanks, do they have sludge in them? And he said, yeah. I mean, w when they take tanks back, they're not cleaning every tank every time. Now, he said, you know, we, his company, he provides service-grade tanks for cases where the uh, customer really needs an absolutely clean tank. But that is a whole other process, which adds a lot of expense. He said some OEMs ask for that. But in general, those tanks are, they've got whatever sludge in the bottom of them uh, from whatever practices the last guy had. And so do you really want to take refrigerant, put it in a tank that potentially has sludge in the bottom, recharge the system via a liquid and you know that has that dip tube within a recovery tank right that dip tube that draws from the bottom where that refrigerant liquid refrigerant is acting as a solvent and kind of clearing all that stuff out and then potentially throwing that into the system that you're working on i don't have the answer for you on that one but it's why we're getting more and more away from recharging with the refrigerant that we pull out and it's unfortunate because you know it's additional cost but the risk of potentially contaminating a system means that I'm just more and more prone. Because again, and, and somebody in the chat saying this, if it's a burnout, no. But even if it's not a burnout, are you protecting from what potentially was in that tank from the last guy? Because I'm not even talking about your company. You could have a nice new painted tank. That doesn't mean it's a brand new tank. It just means they repainted it when it went to the recycling plant or whatever. Um, there could still be sludge in the bottom of that tank. And when you charge liquid out of the bottom, you know, what are you doing? So so that's something to think about, at least. My suggestion would be, as a minimum, would be to begin charging through a filter dryer. Now, that filter dryer is not going to dry it out. You still have to pull a vacuum on your tanks. That's a practice you have to follow anyway. Pull them down sub 500. Um, so you got to do that. 
But then also when you charge out of a recovery tank, I would charge through a filter dryer, and at least that's going to catch you know the the solid stuff. Um, is it going to catch all the acids or anything else that potentially is in that sludge? No, um, but it will catch those solids. One question in the chat is, can pulling a vacuum on that tank help? Vacuums only remove vapors. So even water vapor. So even if you have liquid water, for example, a vacuum pump has to first boil that water before it can pull it out. The vacuum pump does nothing for solid contaminant. Vacuum does nothing for solid contaminant. Does nothing for sludge. Does nothing for acid. Does nothing for any of that stuff. So just things for you to think about. But I would suggest um, if you're going to char recharge your system out of a recovery tank that you charge through a filter dryer. Also, um, charging liquid is a greater risk for sludge. So if you have a refrigerant that's a single component like R22, you can charge via vapor, and that's going to be more likely that you're not going to get sludge back in the system. But charging vapor is more of a risk for non-condensables. Now, I write nitrogen in air because when I say non-condensables, a lot of people don't know what non-condensables are. They think solids or liquids are non-condensables, and they aren't. Non-condensables specifically talking about gases that don't condense. And in an air conditioning system, that's nitrogen and air. That's really the, the main things So that you have to think about. All right, so now let's talk about uh, tank capacity. So we have to talk about WC and TW, which are very simple, but you got to know what they are. Most of you probably already know. Some of this you're probably like, geez, Brian, you're insulting our intelligence. But we have to review these things because a lot of people don't know. And if you don't know, you don't know, right? One of the things that drives me craziest about our trade is people are afraid to ask because when they ask, people say, well, you should have already known that doesn't matter what people should already know. They only know what they know. And so TW, tear weight, is the empty weight. So just the tank, empty. Water capacity, WC is water capacity. That's how much water the tank can hold. Just that simple. Tear weight is empty weight. Water capacity is how much water it can hold. Now, we know we only want to fill tanks to 80% max. Everybody knows that. So a lot of people will say take 80% of water capacity, and that's what you fill it with. But it's not that simple, and we'll talk about this in a second. It's not that complicated either. Uh, we don't have to get so mathy about it all the time or make it overly complicated. But you do need to know how much refrigerant you can put in that tank. But it's easy. If you pull this tank off your truck, and you see this one here is 28.3 pounds, and if it weighs out at 32.3 pounds, it's got 3 pounds of refrigerant in it. Now, what I've noticed is, is a lot of times the tear weights aren't exactly right. You know, they might be off just a, you know, a, a couple points here or there, a few ounces, and that's not a big deal. Um, but that is part of the problem of when you're talking about critically charged systems. You have to have weighed that exact tank before and then weigh it while you're charging or while you're recovering. And that's why people who aren't using scales all the time, uh, it's, it's a real problem in our trade, people failing to use scales, because this is why a lot of systems end up getting vastly overcharged or why people end up overfilling tanks because they're just not weighing the tank. Um, the, the policy I would strongly suggest you implement is that you pull the scale off the truck every time you pull a tank off the truck. I guess if it's nitrogen, then that doesn't count. But every time you pull a recovery or charging tank, a refrigerant tank off the truck, also pull a scale off the truck. All right, so the standards for recovery tanks uh, fall in two buckets. Um, AHRI has a guideline, AHRI guideline K2015, um, that talks about the testing of the cylinders and uh, fill value and all that. And then also the DOT is really one of the big uh, arms that regulate the transport of uh, refrigerants in general. Because again, anytime you're transporting gases, it's the DOT that, that matters with that. So these are the two sets of regs you want to look at a lot. I'm focusing here on the AHRI guidelines. Cylinders need to be tested every five years. Often that doesn't happen. But if you're following a good practice where you're sending it into a uh, reclaim facility, then they're going to take them out of service and have them retested before they send them back out, which is why we do that. Again, regardless of how you're doing it, is if you're using, if you're doing recovery like you should, you should be cycling through tanks like crazy in your supply house or your uh, reclaim facility that you're using, whoever you're dealing with for refrigerant they're going to handle that part of the, the that part of the equation of testing the cylinders. Don't fill past 80%, but recognize that that is a moving target depending on temperature. And so this is where it gets a little funny. Okay, so AHRI K2015 talks about 80% at 77 degrees Fahrenheit, and I'm going to show that here in a second. But also most of these, when you start to look at the at the safety data sheets, about 130 degrees is what they reference. And that is the temperature. Say you're a service technician in the desert, 
of Arizona, you know, what's the hottest the back of your truck's going to get? Probably in that range, right? And so I like us to think in terms of making sure we don't overfill at that maximum temperature just to be on the safe side. Now, a lot of people have said, look, you know, AHRI's already thought about this. They said 77 degrees, so make it 77 degrees. Again, it's going to be rare that we need to get a tank that full anyway. So I would rather you leave it a little less full than it needs to be. Just a little. I'm not saying, you know, send it back with a couple pounds in it. But just a little less full, just so that way you don't accidentally overfill it. But regardless, the way that you do it uh, in order to in order to compensate for this water capacity, because remember, this WC is water. We have to calculate it for refrigerant. So we take gross cylinder weight, um, 0.8, so that's 80%, times the water capacity, times um, specific gravity. Sorry, I wanted to say sensible gravity. My brain wasn't working. The specific gravity of the refrigerant, which is really just a multiplier, which we're, we're going to look at a much simpler way of doing this. I'm just telling you the AHRI way. Um, and then plus the tear weight. So the tear weight's the empty weight. So when you're looking at a scale, keep in mind the tank weighs something too. That's the tear weight. So that's the way that you calculate how much fill. Again, don't worry about that. I'm going to show you a, a simpler way. AHRI guideline says that it's based on, again, I'm just showing you the same thing here, but it's saying specific gravity of the refrigerant recovered at 77 degrees Fahrenheit. Also keep in mind that a lot of times when we're recovering, in the process of recovering, we're getting the tank hot. Now, this is just another thing when you think about this 130 degrees. We don't want that tank to get above whatever the safety data sheet says, which is usually around that 130 degrees. So just use 130 in your head. You don't want that tank to get higher than 130 degrees anyway, just as standard practice. So if you were in a case where I don't know why you'd be storing refrigerant in a room that's more than 130 degrees and the exception of the back of a hot van, but if you were, don't do it. You're not supposed to do it, basically. You're not supposed to store refrigerant in over 130 degrees or get the tank over 130 degrees. All right, so this chart, uh, courtesy of Eric Kaiser, I put his name up right up there because he's the one who made this. He gives a bunch of multipliers. He shared this in the HVAC school group. He did it based on 130 degree temperature refrigerant density, which makes it a little bit more on the safe side. It's not a huge difference in weight, but it makes it a little on the safer side. So you take the tank water capacity and you multiply it times the fill multiplier and then times 0 0.08 plus tear weight equals maximum total tank weight. Um, so that this is, again, the chart that Eric made, but it makes it simple. R22 is so close to water that you can almost just use water. So in R22, you can pretty much just take that point, um, take the water capacity, multiply it times 0.8, and that's your fill. So that makes it pretty easy. Uh, but when you go to things like 410A, well, now your multiplier is lower. So now, now you see we got a multiplier of 0.91, which means you can't fill it as much. So that is a factor uh, when you're filling these tanks. Again, step one is start using a scale. If you're not using a scale, start using a scale. Step two is get more involved so you make sure that you're not overfilling these tanks. Again, for service technicians, um, you're generally not going to get overfilled filled anyway, but, uh, but you just wouldn't want to. And from a practical standpoint, the way you're going to keep track of this is by just constantly weighing your tanks. You know what's in it. Keep a little tag on it so you can write you know, the job numbers or addresses of jobs you've used it with that particular tank and how much you pulled out every time so you can keep really good uh, really good track of that those are just best practices and those are best practices i think when some people hear me talk about this stuff they think it's pie in the sky stuff this is what we do at my company um, and i didn't always do this i wasn't always uh you know I, I didn't always do everything the way i was supposed to and even now i'm sure i don't uh, but we try to implement it as much as we can whenever we find out about things and these are some really good uh, practices so Here's some important safety and compliance considerations. Use a scale at all times while charging and recovering. Don't overfill, which means go over 80% liquid fill. Um, don't overheat based on the SDS. And so if you look at uh, Eric's chart here, not he doesn't just go on 130. He actually looked up the SDS uh, storage temp for all these refrigerants. And you can see some of them are actually lower than 130 degrees, which means that you wouldn't want them in the back of a super hot van in the middle of the desert. Um, you could run into potential safety issues there. So just don't overfill over 80. You'll, you'll be in good shape. Um, don't overheat. Store tanks properly, meaning having them properly chained in place, strapped in place, that sort of thing. And then don't vent and don't mix. Um, if you don't vent and you don't mix refrigerants, 
the EPA is going to be pretty good with you uh, most of the time, unless you're working on really big stuff, and then that's where leak rate requirements come in and all of that. But recharging, you're fine for most of what we do, uh, and pulling vacuums to zero, or not pulling vacuums, sorry, um, recovering to zero, uh, atmospheric is generally allowable. Now, from a good practices standpoint, when you pull to zero, I want to see you valve off and wait and see if those pressures rise just to see if you still have some liquid in the system. It's just a good practice um, because you don't want to leave liquid in the system. So if, you, if you're imagining you're pulling the system down with a recovery machine, just valve it off. Make sure that it's not jumping back up, which shows that there's liquid in the system. All right, so now this is recovery quality best practices. So first we had safety and compliance. Now quality. Pull a deep vacuum on the tank first that's going to make the, the process easier and it's going to make sure you don't contaminate the refrigerant um, uh, use a quarter inch flare dryer for recovery and recharge from the tank now you can use bigger than quarter inch but i would suggest getting uh, the largest quarter inch flare dryer you can get from your local refrigeration supply house and using that um, for recovery and recharge it's just it's just handy if you want to put a sight glass on it as well so you can take a you know take a look at the refrigerant and know when you're you know pulling liquid or vapor that's also very helpful so you can you know hook those up in tandem make a couple little fittings for yourself have your dryer have your sight glass i like it when people take those little extra steps um, so that way they can you know kind of control the environment I, I wish manufacturers would start to include more of this some of them include dryers but often they're very small i want to see larger filter dryers and i want to see sight glasses um, that would be a nice thing to have now on sight glasses Sometimes they can be restrictive. We don't want to add additional restriction. So maybe hit or miss. Use them if you want to. I like the idea, at least. Um, but frankly, have I always done it? No, I haven't. But it's a good idea. Um, pull slightly below atmosphere and allow to equalize to ensure no more liquid is present. Like we mentioned, that's a best practice. Um, exchange smaller tanks uh, with refrigerant uh, reclaimers for better prices on valuable refrigerant. So this is a, a just a best practice, which is that if you're dealing with expensive refrigerants like R22, um, I don't suggest that you have a giant tank at the shop that you dump all of the tanks into. And the reason why is because there's a much higher risk nowadays of cross-contamination because there are so many companies putting other refrigerants on top of the refrigerant that's already in there, like putting 407C in on top of R22. That would be one of the most common ones. And so you don't want to contaminate a whole bunch of R22 um, by... Uh, putting a little bit of 407C mix on top of it with one system that happened to be cross-contaminated or one guy who mixed some 410A with the 22 in his tank and then put it in there. So using and exchanging smaller tanks um, is a good is a good bet. Uh, somebody said that uh, they lost me. Let's make sure that I'm still showing up here. Just give me one second to make sure I'm showing that I'm still here. I think you might be saying that you lost me on screen. I took myself off screen just because, just so you can see behind me. So I do that in the stream. Um, another best practice is to put tags with recovery mounts and tech name on the tanks. That's the old put your name on it thing. When you put tech's names on the tag, they're going to be much more likely to be honest with what's on the tag. And then when they turn in the tank, it's got to have the tag on it just as part of kind of your warehouse policy. Um, and it just helps you keep track of refrigerant recovery. Yeah, I, I just take myself in and out of the screen just so I'm not always blocking what's on it with my big fat head. All right, so here are some speed tips. Now I'm going to go ahead and um, bring up the, uh, the call-in. Hold on one second here. This is my call-in number. So anybody who wants to call in, if you've had any questions or anything that you want to mention about your best practices, this is the number you can call in at now. If you call in, I'll bring you in on the conversation. Um, it's only one person at a time with this. So if you have something you want to talk about, you can go ahead and call in. Uh, but I'm just going to keep going until anybody does. Um, for speed tips, use a quality recovery machine. I have a couple brands that I like. This isn't really a brand-based thing, but you know I really like NAVAC um, recovery machines, and I really like the Fieldpiece MR45 recovery machine. I've used Appion for years. Those are really the three um, that I've used a lot and I have a lot of confidence in. Um, currently, my go-to uh, on my truck is either the MR45 or the NRDD from NAVAC. Those are the two that I use most often. All right, we got a caller. Hey, this is Brian. Who's uh, who's on the line with me? Uh, this is Michael. Hey, Michael. How's things? Oh, good. Good. So what do you got going on? Oh, just uh, watching in on your uh, webinar here. 
Awesome. So what type of work do you do? Uh, service tech. Service tech. Okay. And so what, uh, well, let's start here. What is your recovery rig? That's always a fun question. What do you recover with? The uh, exact same field piece that you're uh, giving away today. Great. So you probably wouldn't mind winning another one, I wouldn't imagine. No, for uh, personal use, but uh, yeah. <laughs> cool. So how do you like it? Uh, it's uh, fast. It's uh, surprisingly fast. The uh, forget the brand of the uh, previous one. It was the blue and gray one, but uh, that one took uh, easily twice as long. Yeah, it's it, it is. It's it's nice and fast because it's got a nice size condenser coil on it, um, and it 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 does it, it does a nice job. Um, I've you know I, I we did one of the first tests of it when it came out, and I really liked it. Um, do you work on any big stuff, or is it mostly residential? Resi and uh, small commercial up to about fifteen ton. Okay, um, but uh, to uh, yeah, and to the. One of your points before, we basically, all of our techs, even with full-size trucks, we're rolling with uh, just two different uh, reclaimed tanks, one for uh, 22, one for 410. Yeah, and that's, again, if from a practical standpoint, like I can be pie in the sky all day long about, you know, what, what an ideal situation would be, and an ideal situation for a residential tech would be for, um, but it, it's tough. But I'm more and more, so I, I'm going to ask you this question. What do you think about the question of recharging refrigerant out of a tank so if you take it from the system put it into the tank well what if that what if that tank had some refrigerant from another system or what if that tank had some sludge from the last guy who had the tank what, what are your thoughts on that never mix it um <clears throat> yeah it's they haven't made up one yet we were actually talking about it i'd say probably three weeks ago basically coming up or basically soldering up a uh, filter dryer in line to put it back in, but yeah. it never, I, our company policy is we would never mix something from one system to the next. Right. Right. And that's, so. and that's the EPA standard, but sometimes people will be like, well, you know, there's only a couple pounds and, and I know that it wasn't burned out or whatever, but it just always, it, it scares me. Um, and again, like I, I've never done that. That's never been my stance, but I just know sometimes in the field when people only have two tanks for the two different refrigerants, I, I, I know that sort of stuff happens. And it just makes me cringe. Right. No, and uh, I guess a lot of that depends on the size of the company and ethics, everything else. If it's uh, rolling with two trunk, uh, two chumps in a truck that are installing right. uh, Goodman's. Um, that All right. Easy on the thing, brands. Easy on the uh... brands. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> Fair enough. So. Cool. You got anything else? Nope. That was it. Just wanted to say thanks for, uh, thanks for your podcasts and uh, these Saturday uh Saturday, uh, YouTube. Yeah, well, thanks. It's great talking to you, man. Have a good one. Thank you, sir. All right, so I don't know if any of you have the... Um, I'm going to go ahead and take this down. If anybody else wants to call in, um, feel free. I don't know if any of you have these sorts of rigs. Oh, I got someone else. Here we go. Hey, Brian, Brian speaking. Who's this? Hello? That's the problem with not having a uh, a moderator who takes the calls first. You know, it's kind of a kind of a roll with the punches sort of thing. Let's try it one more time. Hey, this is Brian. Who's this? Hey, Brian. I'm calling from California. Hey, how's it in California? It's a lot uh, a lot earlier. Yeah, yeah, a lot earlier. Yes. Um, so I'm actually in, in HVAC school. I'll be done in two months. But my question is to you is. Uh, uh, I went to actually check on a system and it had leak on it and uh, we put like four pounds of refrigerant in there. Mm -hmm. So I'm going back to fix it. But now when I take that refrigerant out, uh, my question is, should I put the same refrigerant back in or should I put the new one? Uh, yeah. So that's the, that's the question of the moment is that uh, if you, so, so you're repairing the leak or uh, you're, you're, what, what are you going back to do? Yeah, I'm going to repair the leak, so I'm gonna to I'm gonna uh, uh, pump it down and pressurize it and uh, vacuum it, and then now that's the that's the question: Should I put the same refrigerant? I just put it like a few days ago. I just put like four pounds of refrigerant in there. Yeah. So 
if you're pumping it down, so pumping it down is when you close off the liquid line and you put the refrigerant into the condenser. If you're doing that, then it's fine to leave that existing refrigerant. Just don't, if the system is known to have a leak in it, don't pull it below zero. Don't pull it below atmospheric pressure, either with a recovery machine or in pump down. Um, make sure that you fix the leak before you pull it below atmospheric. Otherwise, you're just pulling air and moisture into the system. Um, but sure. but yeah, so it's fine to use it. Uh, if you, Again, if you're taking it and putting it in a tank and putting it back in the system, I think it's fine so long as the tank is clean, you put a vacuum on it, and you're, and you're recovering and recharging through a filter dryer that you're putting in line. That would be sort of my best practice. But just recognize you're still taking a risk because a lot of these tanks, unless the tank is brand new, can still have some sludge mm -hmm. in it and possibly some contaminants. So that's part of what we're talking about here. I don't have answers to all these things, but industry best practice mm -hmm. would be sure. You can you can return that to the system so long as you don't have reason to believe it's contaminated. Well, thank you for the for your podcast. My first time watching it. And, and yeah, actually, it's a brand new system. It's two years old, Goodman, and it has a leak on it. Yeah, I mean, and that's the biggest thing in our industry is that we, you know, fix fix the leaks, fix the problems that exist with the system. Um, you know, it's what keeps us busy, and uh, yeah, so just you know, fix fix what's there. Uh, we don't want to just recharge. We don't want to keep going back. So get it fixed right the first time, and uh, and move along. Well, I hope I win the goodies. I'm watching you. Thank you. Right. Thank you for taking my call. All right. Thank you. Bye bye. All right. This is kind of fun. That kind of works nice. So long as you know. So long as it actually works, right? All right. Um, so some people use these uh, molecular transformators. That's the name that CPS uses for theirs. And these are essentially the same thing. You have a coil. You take this. You dump it into a bucket of water or ice water. And that helps to either condense or subcool the refrigerant before it goes in to the tank, which keeps the tank cool, lower pressure. Um, we've got an example here of an ice bucket. Some people just run a hose over the recovery tank. But as far as speed goes... The best practices are use a quality recovery machine like the ones I mentioned. Use larger tanks. If you're using smaller tanks, um, you're going to max out those tanks quicker. They're going to get hotter quicker. So I would generally suggest using larger tanks. Always remove the cores when you're recovering refrigerant. So you've got to have a core remover tool. You have to know how to use it. And this comes up a lot. I'm going to do some more content on using core remover tools. But watch some videos on that. Pull the Schraders out so that way it's not creating a pressure drop. Because when you create a pressure drop, that's when you're going to have this expansion. There's a restriction, a flow rate. There's all these things that get in the way of getting that refrigerant out quickly. And if you've used, if you've done recovery the old school way with the old blue recovery machine, you know how long that stuff can take. And, and all these things will improve your speed. Um, you can use the inverted tank and go on the vapor side. That is the fastest way. I haven't found that to make a huge difference, honestly. Um, a lot of the manufacturers teach that, and, it's a, and it is the best way. Turn the tank upside down and add the refrigerant to the vapor side. Uh, use a large, use the largest uh, size liquid line filter dryer you can get. Hey, this is Brian, who's talking? Hello? Hello? Hey, I can hear you, I can hear feedback on the other, uh, on the other end if you want to mute the computer or whatever you're listening to me on. Yeah, I'm gonna do that right now, sorry. No problem. Uh, there you go. Hey, who's this? Thank you. This is Matt. Hey Matt, what's going on? Uh, not much. Um, you were saying about getting sludge in the, in the tanks when you uh, recover. Um, is it possible to put any kind of, uh, uh, say, alcohol or acetone into the tank and swirl it around and flush the tank out? Well, so, so the way they do it, uh, the way a manufacturer, not a manufacturer, but the way a reclaimer would do it is they take the entire uh, valve off and then they spray it all up in there and with it upside down and let it drain out. Um, getting that out oh, okay. of the port... I think it's going to be pretty tough. You know, like it's just you have all these forces working against you. I mean, would it could it potentially help to run a bunch through it? Yeah, but then you also run the risk of leaving it in there. Um, I'm going to just strongly suggest against that. Uh, but okay. but yeah, I mean, I, I, anything's possible. But yeah, the way they do it is they take the whole valve off and they have this little wand that goes up in there and sprays and cleans the whole thing out upside down. Yeah, I always try to use a clean tank when I'm doing it. It's not often that I do. I do a lot more installs and service. Yeah, it's, it's a tough one. It's a question where, because even when we say a clean tank, that's the question. Is it really clean? And we just don't know. Unless you cut it open, you don't know what's inside that tank as far as solid contaminants. And the best, uh, the best thing we have to fight against that battle is, you know, when we're taking refrigerant out of a tank or when we're putting it in a tank, running it through 
a good quality uh, liquid line filter dryer. Okay. Makes perfect sense then. All right, man. Thanks for calling in. All right. You're welcome. All right. Somebody else was asking for the number. I'll flash it up there real quick. Um, I do have to keep moving on here if we want to cover everything, but feel free to call. Um, we may go 10, 15 minutes over on this. So um, push pool recovery. Did we cover all this? Uh, yeah, we did. Uh, so again, keeping the tank cool helps. Uh, it's a good practice. There's nothing wrong with running a hose on a tank. Um, obviously, you don't want to get water in around the fittings or that sort of thing if you can help it. Um, but it is a best practice. Hey, this is Brian. Who's speaking? Hello? Hello. Hey. Hey, Brian. Hey, what's going on? How you doing, man? Good, good. Uh, who is this? Uh, this is Fernando in California. Hey, Fernando, another California man. <laughs> yep, I met you before, man. You came down to Oakland uh, last oh, year, and yeah, I was yeah. actually able to go down there and meet you. Yeah, that was great. Yeah, thanks for coming out. That was a, that was a lot of fun. You know, California is kind of like, and I don't take this the wrong way, but it's it's like a completely different world from what I'm used to. But uh, you all made me feel, <laughs> you all made me feel at home, and it was a great time. So yeah, thanks for thanks. That's for cool, me. man. Yeah, so what's That's going cool, on? Cool. Hey, so I just had a question. So if uh, I'm going to be replacing the TXV, I'm going to be pumping down the system. Uh, does that mean I don't have to change out the filter dryer, right? I mean, I could just go ahead and uh, pull a vacuum on my evac coil and line set, and that should be good, correct? Um, it is a – it is – okay, so I'm going to give you two answers. The right answer is is that you should still be replacing the liquid line filter dryer anytime you open the system. Um, the problem is is that sometimes that liquid line filter dryer is located inside the condenser in which you're going to pump down into. And there's a trade-off here, right? The trade-off is because a lot of people have said, well, then you'll just have to recover the charge. And when you recover the charge, uh, well, now you could potentially be contaminating it in the recovery tank. So my best answer at this point is look carefully at the application. Look at how long you're going to keep the system open, what the likelihood is, is that what, that what you're going to do is going to contaminate. For example, a good example would be if I'm replacing, and I'm just going to be honest here, I know I'll get some flack for this, but if I'm replacing a Lennox um, expansion valve with the, uh, I think those are chat lift fittings, yeah, chat lift fittings on them, where you can literally get that system, you can get that thing in and out in a matter of a couple minutes. It's open such a short period of time, and it's so unlikely that you're getting anything in there because you're not brazing or anything, then I'm not probably going to replace that liquid line filter dryer deep inside the bowels of that Lennox heat pump um, because the likelihood that I'm going to do more damage is high. But if the liquid line dryer is accessible, if it's outside the equipment, then, yeah, go ahead and replace it. It's, it is a best practice, and it's considered to be the, the industry-wide. There's nobody in the industry um, who's going to tell you that you shouldn't do it. Um, from a manufacturer standpoint or from a training education standpoint, other than what I just did, um, because I, I do try to be practical as a technician. But again, um, in our company, the policy is to replace it, but there are some exceptions where if we're going to do more harm by replacing it potentially, then we may leave it in. All righty, man. All right, man. That's that's it. All right. Thanks for calling. Thank in, you. Brother. Yep. All right. Push-pull method is great. It works really good. It's a little weird. Um, and again, you're not going to probably memorize this slide. I just put it up here just to kind of reference it because what you're doing in push-pull is you're only it's only designed to get large amounts of liquid out. So if you have at least 30 pounds of liquid or more, like it says here, then use push-pull. If you're working on a big commercial RTU, something like that, because <coughs> what you're actually doing is you're using the machine, the, the recovery machine, to pressurize the system with vapor that then forces the liquid out. So it's kind of an opposite thing. Rather than sucking, it's kind of pushing it in. It's a, it's a weird system. So anyway, it's a good thing to know how to do. Um, if you don't do it regularly, well, then just open this up. This is from the MR45 manual from Field Piece. Uh, it tells you exactly how to do it, and that's what you'll do if you've got a ton of it to remove. And you can see you've got the filter. They say it's optional. I would strongly recommend it. You've got the sight glass. Again, another nice thing to have. That way you can know when you're out of the um, liquid phase and into the vapor phase, and you can also you know, see whether the refrigerant is wet. Again, I wouldn't trust the litmus paper on most of these sight glasses to the ends of the world, but it just gives you another little indication. Also, in some cases, you can actually see things like you know, if there's some sort of dye or something added to the refrigerant that you may not want to put back in. Um, there's just some things to, to consider there. So 
Uh, push pull is a great way of moving a lot of refrigerant really fast. All right, so we're going to get to the giveaway here in a second, but now is a good time for you to call in if you have any questions about anything that we've talked about. I'm going to leave that open for about five more minutes while I review quickly. Um, this chart from Eric Kaiser is great. I don't feel comfortable sharing that with everybody unless uh, he's okay with it. I'll find out, and if so, I'll put it up on the site here shortly. I don't feel comfortable hey, this is Brian. Who, uh, who do we got in the line with me? Hey Brian, it's Alex Orlando. Oh, Alex, What's up, man? I I know exactly yeah. I know exactly who I'm talking to. I saw a 407 number, and I was like hoping it was Alex, <laughs> my buddy Alex. Hey, I, I had a question because um, I'm not sure if you guys have it. Uh, do you reclaim your? You have the machine at your shop. I'm just wondering, like, do HVAC companies do that? Do what? The oh, you mean actually like recover about... the. Re Recycle their own 410. Uh, no, like, no, 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 no. you guys do that? Or? No, 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 no. no I, I don't know of any AC contractor who actually has recycling equipment. Um, no. You're going to deal with a company. Um, the company we deal with is called Certified Refrigerants. They serve your area, um, and they'll actually pay you. And the reason why I use them is for that reason, that, that they will pay for R22, where a lot of times when you go to you know, typical supply houses nowadays, they're just swapping tanks for you. Um, which with 410A is yeah, great because yeah. 410A isn't, isn't worth anything really uh, on the recycled market, but R22 is valuable. So, Okay, so it's like a big operation. Nobody can get into that. I was just wondering. I thought you guys might be doing it. I mean, no, you can get into it, um, but it's just a whole kind of another business. It's a whole it's okay. a whole thing. Yeah. Cool, man. Thank Every, you. Everything Thank else good, everything else right, good with you? Care. Hey, 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 yeah. hey. Everything else good with you in your life? Everything good? Yeah, I just had a triple bypass. Thanks thanks for visiting me in the hospital. Well, I kidding. didn't know when you were doing it. It got pushed back. <laughs> Do you think if you would have told you me anyway, when you corona. were in the hospital? That's right. That's true. That's right. I, I, right. Anyway, so you're f feeling okay? Uh, yeah, I'm about like 70%. Okay. I'm good. All right. Well, glad you're, thanks, glad you're still kidding. All right. Let's rig that recovery machine uh, giveaway. Let's make oh, it happen. All right. All right. Keep let's it in get, Orlando. Let's get to this thing. All right. All right, so if anybody else uh, has anything to call in about, feel free. Um, just gonna re just gonna review again quickly. Man, this is fun. Everybody keeps calling in. Hey, what's up? <laughs> Hello. Hello. Oops, I hung up just when he said hello. This is the this is the downside of this. Um, don't fill tanks over 80%. You got to know something about the specific gravity or you got to use a good chart like what Eric Kaiser uh, made up for us. So if you want to find out more about the specifics of this, AHRI guideline K, you can literally Google this and find it. Hey, this is Brian. What's going on? Hey, this is also uh, Brian, too. I'm from uh, Northern Virginia. How's is your day going? Good, good. Is, is your name spelled with a Y or with an I? Oh, it's spelled like the legitimate way with a Y, man. It's not that brain. I know. The people keep like, I know. Oh, they keep misspelling it my entire life. I know. I feel like, uh, a, man, man, I we are kindred spirits. I can already tell. So, uh, so I what's, feel that, man. I feel it. <laughs> so, what's going on in your life? Um, just um, just taking a day day at a time. You know, dealing with the whole Corona pandemic, but you know, business is still fine. I'm still making money, so I'm happy. Yeah, nothing to complain about. What are you? Are you any any particular thoughts on recovery or questions or anything going on in your brain? Oh yeah, I have a question about recovery. So this is like really minuscule. You'll probably even make fun of me because I, I use a three eighths uh, Appian hose and I and I uh, and I tee it off. But I'm wondering, like, what happened if I used like a AccuTools, like True Blue hose on top of that. Cause I have the MR45 and the MR45 by field piece. It's definitely saved me a lot of time on the jobs, like tremendously compared to like little Robin Air machine I was using before. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the uh, AccuTools hose is not for refrigerant at all. So you don't use the AccuTools hose for recovery. It's strictly for evacuation. So I think what you've already got, um, it's it's diminishing returns with refrigerant anyway because you are dealing with higher pressures. So yeah, it's helpful to use larger hoses. You know, come up with a rig for using larger hoses. Appian's come up with some neat little uh, Ys for making that easier uh, nowadays. But 
Um, but yeah, I would suggest you've already got an MR45. It's a great machine. Some 3 8 hoses. That's great. Use a good uh, quality large um, filter dryer. I think you're. I think you're on the right on the right path there. I wouldn't do anything different than what you got. Yeah, I was like nitpicking it because it's already fast enough. Because I can recover about eight pounds of refrigerant on those uh, Carrier 48 TF mo- model units in about about like ten to twelve minutes. Yeah, that's Crazy. solid. That's solid. Yeah, I mean, again, there it's all of this is diminishing returns at some point. Um, and it, again, for most of what we're doing, we're only recovering down to zero anyway. And so it's not like we're having to pull down into deep vacuums while we're recovering. Um, so yeah, I think what you've got is great and yeah, definitely don't use true blue hoses with refrigerant. They're not designed <laughs> for it. Yeah. All right. Thank you for the heads up, Brian. All right, man. Thanks for, uh, thanks for calling in and thanks for, uh, thank your parents for spelling your name right. All right. Yeah. Yeah. I'll give them a call right now. They're over in Europe. Um, I'll, I'll wake them up. It's, okay. It's, it's important. It's that. that important. They just gotta know. Yeah, absolutely. All right, man. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Bye. All right. So that's it. We've made it. And literally the next person who calls me wins this uh, machine. So the next person who calls in wins the MR45, and then I'm going to grill them on how they do recovery and ask them all sorts of terrible questions in exchange for getting this. Here we go. Who's our winner? My name is Aaron Wright. Hey, Aaron. How the heck are you? Oh, I'm hanging in there. Yeah. I'm a uh, l- little disappointed that the uh... – that we didn't have the the whole uh the what do you call it the teachers uh conference out there in vegas this year kind of bummed me out a little bit but yeah yeah i was not uh, i was all i was all geared up for it i've had a bunch of stuff i missed i was supposed to be at the humid climate conference in austin next week and a bunch of bunch of stuff got canceled but the other side is hey we get a lot of a lot more work done at home i guess i mean at least some some things work so yeah yeah i guess so i i've had to go from uh you know, being in the school to teach in the students because I teach at a, a technical high school here in Delaware, and uh, I've had to go from that to teaching them online, and it's kind of hard to do that uh, with uh, not having any hands-on stuff to to show them other than uh, I I use I use your videos all the time, so it's you know uh, I I use them all day long in my class, so it's uh yeah well, I'm it's I'm, been, I'm uh, sorry I'm sorry you couldn't find anything better, but uh but I I appreciate you <laughs> using them. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> No, not at all, bro. Not at all. All right. No, so, have cool, you though. used the it's... Have you used the MR45 yet? I have not yet. No. Okay. Well, now you're going to get a chance to. So, uh, so yeah, Oops. just just hit me up in my email, uh, Brian at hvacrschool dot com, um, which is plastered okay. everywhere. So, Brian B R Y A N at hvacrschool dot com with your information okay. and where to ship it, and I'll get this uh, I'll get this out to you. But um, tell me a little bit about you know because you're you're an educator. So did I miss anything, yes, anything, uh, anything else that I should have added or anything you would have added in talking about, uh, talking about this topic? No, no. I mean, you, you hit it up pretty well. Um, you know, it was a lot, it was a lot to cover, uh, yeah. you know, in, a, in, in an a hour amount of time, but yeah, uh, yeah. yeah it, it's cause I mean, you can obviously go way further in depth with, with all of that information. Um, but, uh, no, it was definitely it was definitely well covered. Um, I, yeah, again, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to pack all that into an hour and, and, and really get into details and things like that. But, uh, I thought, I thought you covered it great. Well, good. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, yeah. So, so yeah. And, and in fact, so to what you do, um, it's good. It's a good opportunity for me to say this cause this comes up quite often and having, you know, just talked to Jason, um, you're not going to learn how to do recovery in a, presentation on youtube like that's not how this works um and that's what sometimes no. comes up is people get this idea that i'm saying it's like well i didn't learn how to i didn't learn how to do a recovery look the only way you learn how to do a recovery is by learning the best practices learning how to do it safely and then doing it a bunch of times right and that's what school is so good at is giving kids a chance to get reps on equipment getting their hands on things uh traditional schooling apprenticeship programs i'm a really big fan of registered apprenticeship programs those are really important things. Or working with a company that does hands-on training uh, really well. Those are things that are super important. And it's, it's a good moment for me to mention this and kind of throw, uh, throw a bone to traditional education because you've got to get this. Everything we do is learned hands-on truly. But a lot of times what this can do, this sort of thing, is it can spark ideas 
that then you can go and practice and say, well, I'm not quite doing it that way. Or maybe I never thought about the fact that a recovery tank might have some stuff in it still. And I never thought about charging through a filter dryer or something like that. You know, and then you can go out and practice those things and, and try different things. But um, but you're going to love this. You're going to love this machine. Um, like I said, we tested it out when it first came out. And even the first versions that we tried kind of in beta testing, we loved the thing. You can run a hose on it. Um, a bunch of people have done videos of that. I mean, it's just a really hardy machine, really well built, super quiet, super light. Um, yeah, really great thing. So and I was, you know, it's a, if you've priced them out, you know, they're <laughs> you know, they're not cheap. Um, and, oh, yeah. Uh, and yeah, yeah, if you, if you wouldn't mind, uh, you know, maybe thanking field peace on their uh, social media or something, when you finally receive it, um, that would be, that would be Absolutely. much appreciated. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And that's, yeah, you, you, you hit the nail on the head when you're talking about having to, you know, go out and actually do it because I, I know until I started teaching, um, you know, I was in the field for 17 years and when I started teaching and, and really brushing up on all this stuff, I realized how much I was just really how many practices I was taught that weren't, you know, 100% what they should have been uh, and better ways and more efficient ways to do things. Um, so, yeah, it, it's definitely, uh, it's been an eye-opening experience for me. And I, I started teaching the, I'm also a teacher at night for the apprenticeship program here in Delaware as well. Um, and, and it's been, it's been interesting to see the difference because teaching high school kids who think they might want to do HVAC compared to adults who are signing up to do HVAC is a, it's a night and day difference, but uh, I'm always trying to recruit and get people to come in. Cause as you well know, we need more and more people in the trades, you know, more than ever right now, but, uh, but yeah, no, just, just keep pumping out the videos and I hope to, uh, I hope to catch up with you in person again. One of these days I, I did like the first year you came out to the, uh, the HVAC uh, conference out there in Vegas and, uh, but we didn't get a chance to talk much. But, yeah, uh, I'd love to. I'd love to just, love to meet everyone in person. And at, at, and at this moment, you know, never more than right now, do I want to actually meet some people in person. So I look forward to look forward to doing that when the time comes. But don't forget to shoot me that email right away so I can get this out to you. And uh, yeah, and congrats. Will do. Thank you so much. I'm 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 stoked because I was actually uh, looking at purchasing one because I do have my own small HVAC company here as well. So uh, that's one less thing I got to worry about. Great. So. Absolutely awesome. Love to support small business. All right. Thanks, brother. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right. So I'm going to put up this. Uh, I have just a few more minutes in case anybody else wants to call in, ask any questions. Um, but I just want to say thank you to all of our sponsors. Some of them have been you know, scrolling on screen here. Refrigeration Technologies, Navac, Blue On, um, Speed Clean, Carrier. Those are all companies that have worked with us for a long time and obviously Field Peace. It means a lot to have companies support what we do because it makes it possible in the format and the amount of time that I spend on all of this. Um, it really does make it possible. So those companies uh, deserve a, a shout out. Um, very thankful to all of you who spend the time to do these sorts of things. Um, if, as you know, everything that I do, that's why I do it in these public forums, is free for you to use, free to you, for you to extract from, all of that. So feel free to use that. Hey, this is Brian. Yes, uh, this is for recovery question, or not question, but a response. Awesome. Um, the new four-cylinder, um, Navac. Yeah. Uh, fastest thing I've ever used. Nice. Absolutely beat all others hands down. Nice. How long have you had it? Uh, I've had it for, I think, going on two months now. Okay. Uh, I got it from True Tech Tools. And uh, comparing it, I've had the Appian. I had, uh, I have the, the Appian kept breaking down, so it's a doorstop now. I have uh, the field piece is great, and um, I had one of the other ones, a, a black one. I can't even remember the name of it. But ever since I got this one here, definitely hands down could do several more recoveries or large systems in a flash. It just nothing compares to it. Yeah, it's it's. And so it's, if money and making money, money yeah. Yeah, it's it's got a double row condenser in it. It's a four cylinder uh, machine. I mean, it's the it is the Mac Daddy uh, machine that you can buy. There are there are ones that are designed specifically for the commercial industry that are kind of like made to order almost that that are bigger. Big but as far as ones that you can buy off the shelf, yeah, it's the it's the biggest baddest one on the market right now. Um, and yeah, I definitely put that in the same category. I, I love the MR forty five. Love the Navac recovery machines. All all great, all great machines. Yeah. I actually, my, I could definitely say 
I could do an extra two. If you have a lot of recoveries in one day or you're doing a lot, uh, I could pump in another one or two jobs a day just because of that machine. That's how much of a difference it makes. Uh, I, I personally got this particular machine for doing big VRF when I, you know, doing a 20 ton yeah. system or 60 ton yeah. system. But once I used it on like little five ton systems would have 12 pounds in them or something like that, it just blew me away on how fast it was. It's like I had to retire my other units. Yep. And uh, so, yeah, great machine. Awesome. Recommend it to everybody if they could pop for the price. Awesome. Well, yeah, thanks for calling in. Thank you. All right. Um, yeah, and as I was doing this, you know, we kind of started with the EPA stuff. There we go. Another call. Hey, this is Brian. Who's calling? Hey, Brian. This is Rookie from California. How are you doing? Hey, another California. This is like the California invasion. I'm doing great. How are you? Good. I, I met you over at um, AHR with uh, Gil. Okay. But I do have a question about what you do in your market. I know you guys uh, bury your line sets. So how do you guys uh, determine leaks? Do you just replace the whole line set? Um, so when we bury line sets, it's not like they're generally buried deep. I mean, it's just a matter of in new construction. And, and again, Florida is just a weird state. I don't know if you've ever you know, seen the Florida man stuff. We just we do things weird in Florida. And so in new construction, they bury chases, PVC chases. And it's just at the slab level, just below the slab level. And so you're generally talking about, you know, maybe, you know, maybe 10, 12, 18 inches below the dirt. Uh, and so we can always dig it up to gain access to it. As far as it running through under the ground, it's very rare that that is ever going to leak unless some salt or some other corrosive gets to it. So the times that we see that leak would be cases where, um, you know, maybe you have a uh, – saltwater discharge from a water softener or something okay well like i said i always was wondering i asked gil and gil's like you should have asked him when we met <laughs> i was like well i didn't think of it till now yeah i mean it's not ideal it would be better if we would run them through the walls or overhead and in fact a lot of times when we have issues we do rerun them overhead but it's just a matter of what's there um i'm not a company you know for a while everybody was like you always got to replace copper uh, we don't always replace copper. It depends on the application. We're big fans of pipe wiper, um, where we use the the pigs that we actually force through the lines that get them, you know, sparkling clean, um, and then we we pressure test. So, uh, but yeah, it's not a, in Florida. We have some unique conditions because our soil is very sandy and our ground temperatures are not very cold, and so because of that, we don't have that oil trap uh, sort of situation that you run into in others. And even then, it's not like we're running them long distances underground. In general, you know, it's in a chase, and so it's not actually touching ground. It's touching PVC, and then uh, it may be going a few feet underground outside. So, you know, we, we still try to avoid running them underground long distances. So what would you say the maximum is that you would run underground? I don't have a – there's not like a um, like a white paper or something on it. But for us, if it's more than 10 feet, um, we're generally going to try to find another way. Oh, okay. Well, I appreciate you taking the call. I was just curious, so I figured I'd hit you up. Yep, no problem. Thanks, Thanks for, for the podcast. Yeah, absolutely. Have a good one. All right. Well, we're gonna go ahead and uh, we're gonna go ahead and wrap it up now. Thank you all for uh, thank you all for calling in. Thank you all for participating. It's a lot of fun. Uh, it's fun just to talk to people and uh, you know talk about things that we do. And like I mentioned, um, you know we try to we try to cover as much as we can, but we're obviously not gonna cover everything. We'll take one more call. Hey, this is Brian. Hello? Hello? Hey, this is Brian. See, that's probably Hello? Delay. Hello. If you can shut off your hey, uh, if you can shut off the sound on your computer, it's back feeding through your through your phone. Hello? Hey, this is Brian. Yeah. Hello? Yep, I'm here. Hey, Gun, is that Brian, is it? It's Brian. Hey, Gun, there, Brian. Scott from Australia, mate. How are you? <laughs> awesome. What time is it in Australia? Oh, I can tell you it is 20 past 11. Okay, wow. In the AM. Okay, all right. So it's not too bad. Not too bad. So what's going on in your world? Uh, not too much. And just I just got a question um, with these alternative refrigerants. Mm -hmm. Um, I started off, I'm an adult apprentice, so to speak, midlife career change. Mm -hmm. And um, 
I started working off for a couple of months with one guy, and he used all the correct refrigerants, the true blue stuff. To, and then I worked for another guy, and he's into these um, natural refrigerants, like high chill, high, uh, high chill 50, high chill 30, hmm. like a propane, like a mixture, oh. natural gas. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, um, and I don't know what the so I can't speak to any regulations or laws in Australia because I don't know them. Um, so I, I can't. Well, reference that, but. apparently you don't need a license for them. Apparently it's a, you know, I see it as a training refrigerant really myself. But um, for example, minus forty is a high purity, two ninety and uh, two ninety single ingredient refrigerant, and. Um, we find the pressures are roughly the same. Oh yeah, you know it's just that some you you got to you know, adjust for super heat, especially if you haven't got a thick orifice. You know, but um, yeah. What's your opinion on these refrigerants? Well, there's some there's some significant dangers if the equipment's not designed for it, because if you yeah, have, well, that's... you know, if somebody uses a torch around it, you could have an explosion, terminal venting. Have you ever seen a compressor blow a terminal? Well, that's right. I mean, you could have a bomb on your well, hands. Well, especially, and they also, they're using it in cars as well now to replace R134A and R12, so. Yeah, I mean, it's, I like it. It's supposed I, to cover both. I like it if it's design, if the system was originally engineered for it. I don't have a problem with R290, so long as it's got all the stickers on it that's labeling it and the equipment was designed for it, and they, they took uh, precautions in case there was terminal venting for it not to turn into a, to a flamethrower. But for, for, yeah. for companies to use it as a retrofit, yeah, I'm completely against it because the risks are just so high. <laughs> well, systems design the way they're designed to take the refrigerant that they're designed to take. Right. Unless you can't get the refrigerant no longer. Yeah, and again, are there are there cases where you could go to alternative refrigerants and follow manufacturer's specifications in order to make alterations? In certain segments of the industry, we do that all the time, like grocery store refrigeration. So in grocery refrigeration, you know, sometimes you're forced to make retrofit changes because of changes in the uh, environmental laws. Yeah, well, that's things, right, but... especially going from R22 and that because the Australian government's really cranking down twice as hard as what they are on you. They're just they're ridiculous here down to the gram almost. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah. But I just find it a liability. Like, I was working with someone who, to start off with, who I believe was doing everything the correct way. And now I'm working with someone else who's using refrigerants that I'm, well, he obviously knows how to use them, but I don't feel it's benefiting my training at all. Yeah, I I um I don't think he obviously knows how to use them. I think he's probably using them because they work, and there's a big difference between something working and it being safe. Um, R290 has great properties. Or R290 is a great refrigerant, but that still doesn't mean that it's safe yeah. to put in your home air conditioner. You know, it's it's not safe to just put into an air conditioner. Well, so my 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 argument with my trainer 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 now is. Just because you got IEC license to handle refrigerants doesn't make you a good mechanic, <laughs> right? Or a safe one. There are a lot of mechanics who are good technically, but who make really bad safety choices, um, and that's a that's yeah, an important well, thing to consider. Yeah, it is. It is. But it, it's so I've gone from motor mechanics to um, to refrigeration now because motor mechanics never change the same day in day out. Blah blah blah. But with refrigeration, it's Always, always something different. Always right. something that I learned something I've never thought I'd learn. I thought I'd know something really well, and then something new comes up. Yep. A new formula I've got to learn. Yep. And that's what we, and, and that's the number one thing when I ask people who love the trade what they love about it, they'll always say it's always something new. There's always a new challenge. So people who like to challenge uh, their minds, who like new things, uh, something new to learn all the time, this really is a great trade. So, yeah, we're really glad. Well, to, we're really glad. What's to have the you. what's the advice would you have? Because like I've got more interest in um, like I've been wanting to design my own systems, but I'm not game enough to ask the boss if I can pin some um some of his gas or anything like that. If you know what I mean, I'm not haven't been that long in the job. Right. But I've been wanting so, so much to 
experiment with um, fixed orifices and all that and see, you know, just seeing what different effects I get with different types of condensers and evaporators, you know, yeah. on a static level. Yeah, I mean, just, it, you know, for me on experimenting, you know, with me probes and and check for super cool and see what length of the capillary tube, if I'm using capillary tube, what the length does to it, if I shorten it or lengthen it or, you know, my own experiments for my own learning curve. Yeah, no, I suggest it strongly. And, and most um, contractors who uh, are the right kind of contractors are going to be excited to help you do that. Um, you know, maybe some older. Nah, the got bloke older. I'm working for now, he's um, he kn- he knows it. Watch what I'm doing. Do what you're told. Don't do what I do. <laughs> and it's confusing. Yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> there's, yeah. A, there's a lot of that out there. Yeah, but yeah. Thanks so much for calling you in. You get that in any industry. Yep, for sure, for sure. All right, brother. Thank you so much. Not a problem. Have a good have a good one, Brian. And thanks for everything, mate. Yep, you too, brother. Thank you. All right. So that is it. I'm not taking any more phone calls. I need to figure out how to shut off this phone so that way no more come in. That's actually something I didn't figure out how to do at first, and that's a mistake. That's what we like to call a mistake. But uh, yeah, thank you all so much for uh, thank you all so much for calling in. Thank you for being part of what we do here. And sometimes, you know, this this sort of thing is a little you know it's a little you know by the seat of our pants. But that's how we like it. I think at least that's how I like it. I don't know. It's fun talking to people. It's cool. Somebody from Australia just called. That's neat. I like that. So, uh, so yeah, uh, Steve's saying, if you, give me a thumbs up on the live stream. That would You don't have to do that, but I would certainly appreciate it. It would mean a lot. Um, the channel has been growing by leaps and bounds thanks to you because I just get on here and yammer away about uh, weird air conditioning stuff like a nerd. Um, somebody asked if Kalos, my, my company, is in Cape Coral. And, yeah, on the commercial side, we cover the whole state. We have a couple statewide commercial contractors that we cover. We do you know, some grocery stuff and some of that sort of thing. We only do residential in a very small part of the state of Florida. But anyway, that is it. Thank you all so much. And uh, we'll see you next time, next week. We do this almost every Saturday at 8 p.m. Watch out in your email, watch in the HVAC School Facebook group, or just you know subscribe to the YouTube channel, hit the notification button, and uh, and we'll, it'll notify you every time I go live. And if you can make it, great. And if not, it'll always be there on the re- replay, right? But you can't win an awesome recovery machine. Uh, like uh, we gave away today in the replay. So you never know when that's going to happen. I have a feeling that some of my other sponsors are going to be like, hey, how come you didn't tell me we could do giveaways? So I'm sure we'll probably have some more giveaways coming, uh, forthcoming, coming with great haste. (laughs) All right, thank you all. Enjoy your families. Stay safe out there. And uh, keep doing the best trade out there, in, in my opinion. And also just because it's a fact. It's just the best trade. All right. See you next time on the HVAC School Podcast.